Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the Johnson's Wax Program. Tonight you'll see what we believe to be an unusual story. It's about an actor retired against his will, an English inn by the sea, and a woman loved by two men. I'll be back in a moment. any number of ways of giving your car protection from the elements. For instance, one way might be to cover it with blankets, a couple of hot water bottles, and an umbrella. Kind of silly, but that would protect it. However, there's an easier and more effective way. Use Johnson's car plate. Here's the easy way to wax a car. Just spread car plate over the clean finish in long, light strokes. Then when car plate is dried to a light haze, wipe it off, like this. As you wipe off the haze, you uncover a brilliant, long-wearing, real wax finish. Your waxing job is done in 20 minutes. No rubbing needed. A car plate shine is as good a shine as a hard rub professional job that costs $15 or more. And when you get your can of car plate, get Johnson's new car plate cleaner, which cleans your car super clean for a perfect car plate waxing. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer and host for Johnson's Wax, Robert Montgomery. The Ringmaster was adapted for television by Alvin Sappensley from a play by Keith Winter. It's not a circus story, as you might think from its title, but the title is significant, as you will soon see, and significant, too, are the words Johnson's Wax. They stand for the finest in wax products for home and industry. Tonight, we have a really outstanding cast of players. We are most proud to welcome to our series Vincent Price, whose standout performances in such films as Leave Her to Heaven, Song of Bernadette and Laura, as well as many other films and stage plays have placed him at the top of the acting fraternity. To Vincent, we say welcome. I hope this will be the first of many appearances with us. Also starred tonight is Anna Lee, whom you'll remember, I'm sure, for her outstanding performance in our recent production of The Truth About Blades. We say welcome back to Anna. And to Robert Coote, whose fine work in Stay Away to Heaven, Sheppy, and Cashel Byron's profession on this series make his return visit also a very welcome one. Now to our story. It opens somewhere on the coast of Devon, England, where a man named George Amberwell is having a bit of trouble. Ah, ah. here's your trouble, sir. <laughs> the fuel pump. Afraid it's had it? Yes, <clears throat> I'm afraid I've had it. Uh, uh, tell me, excuse my ignorance on this matter, but uh, how far can I go without a fuel pump? <laughs> ah, you don't know much about your own motor car, do you? Well, in the first place, it's not my car. It was loaned to me by somebody I considered to be a friend. Uh -huh. And its condition was vouched for. Now, in the second place, uh, without this uh, fuel pump thing you call, um, can I get to Torquay on the remaining instruments? Or have they had it too? <laughs> well, I don't know. She's not such a heavy job and... No. Torquay's only 20 odd miles from here. If your wind's, wind's in good condition, you might be able to push her there in a couple of days. A couple of days? <laughs> you mean it, it won't go at all? Well, not under her own power, no. not with a fuel pump gone. Perfectly ridiculous. I mean, there's a whole hood full of instruments, and one goes wrong, and the rest is had it. I mean, absolutely. Well, what are we going to do? Leave it with me, sir. I'll have a writer's rain by tomorrow evening. Oh. Tomorrow week? No sooner than that. I'm afraid not. So happens I don't have a pump in stock to fit you. Have to wait till I drive into Exeter tomorrow afternoon. As mm. soon as I get the part, it won't take a minute getting uh, it in there. Very inconvenient, I must say. Well, as it looks as if I'm going to spend the next day here, uh, would you mind telling me where I am and uh, what arrangements can be made for eating, washing the hands and sleeping? Oh, uh, as to where we are, we're nowhere in particular. Oh. Uh, we're a few miles between Exmouth and Tainmouth, 
and a little bit south of Newton Abbott. Places called Lime Furrows. Lime Fer Oh, well, there must be a Lime Furrows Hotel. Huh? Uh, there's an inn, sir. A red roof, it's called. But I can't rightly recommend it, never having been inside the place myself. As a matter of fact, this is the first year it's been open. Oh, well, uh, how do I get there? It's called Red Roof, is it? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I'll show you. Right. Uh, uh, take this road you're on and yes. follow it down about a quarter of a mile or so. Yes. You come on another road, not concrete like this one, but tar oh. leading off oh. to the right. Yes, yes. Uh, it's called Phantom's Lane, yes. because way back in the old days, when the smugglers used oh, to... Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure, yes, I can see the whole point here. Yes, Phantom, yes, rather, very good, very funny. Uh, now, all right, we go down the road, yes. Oh, well, you, you follow it down about mm. 100 yards or so down towards the sea. Yes. You can't miss Red Roof. There's a sign outside, and, uh, and it's the only house on the left as you face the beach. It's got a steeple on the seaside and a green roof. A green roof? Yes, sir, that's it, Red Roof. Only, as I say, this is the first year it's been open, and I'd be lying if I said I could recommend yeah, it. Yeah, thanks very much. Well, I'll get along, all right. Thank oh, oh. Are you an actor, sir? Actor? Certainly not. I'm a stage manager. Actors are flighty, unreasonable people with little more than a nodding acquaintance with the truth. It was an actor who lent me that car. Goodbye. I'll see you tomorrow evening, six. Uh, right along this road, so about a quarter of a mile, then you're right down towards the sea. Red Roof, it's called. You can't miss it. This way, sir. Put your bags down. Wait in here, sir. I'll fetch Mrs. Hammond. Mrs. Hammond is the proprietor of the Red Roof. Well, I only want a room for a night, you know. My car broke yes, down and... Yes, sir. Mrs. Hammond will take care of you. Oh, oh you're, you're not full up, are you? I'll fetch Mrs. Hammond. You can't be here. Well, of course, it's completely possible for you to be here. Anne Hammond. In person. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's been years, absolutely years. Oh, you're the last person I expected to find in Lyme Well, <laughs> of course, it's completely commonplace to find you here. Anne Hammond. Oh, no, really. <laughs> <laughs> However did you manage to find me? <laughs> I'm sure it was my last intentions in the world. I was on my way to Torquay in my car. Oh, well, forget that. What are you doing here? running a hotel. Oh, you're not. Well, you'll think differently, young man, when you get your bill in the morning. <laughs> We're putting you in uh, number six. It's quite a good room, has a splendid view of the dunes. Would you like to register? The books are all. <laughs> I can't believe it. No. <laughs> is, is Peter here? Well, of course he is. Why not? Oh, yes, of course. Why not? How long? Oh, about a year now. Mm. You see, we were casting around wondering where to go and what to do. And then finally Peter said, why don't we take the money, uh, the money from the accident, and set ourselves up as a pair of in innkeepers? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, why not? And Peter couldn't think of any why not, so we hunted around and found Red Roof. Which you painted red, green. <laughs> it always was green. Oh, always green. Well, why call it Red Roof? It must disturb me. <laughs> I haven't the faintest idea. Oh, but George, oh. this is wonderful. It really is. Oh, Peter will be delighted. How is Peter? Oh, never better. <laughs> Eats like a horse and sleeps like a drama critic. So do I, for that matter. Give us the simple life any day, George. <laughs> yes, now I look at you more closely, I can see that. <laughs> you look like a bucolic Beatrice. Oh! Most disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I, um... I was in the provinces when the accident happened. Didn't get back to London till the lawsuit was on. And... Yes, well... Well, it's all over and done with. We're as happy as larks and up to our elbows in the hotel business. Peter has great plans for expanding as soon as we get a few seasons under our belts. How's business? Oh, so-so just now. And as a matter of fact, we've only got Mrs. West and her son and uh, Mrs. Lancaster, a widow. Oh, but George, we can't let you run away like this. You must stay a week at least, guests of the management. Oh, but darling, look, I had to go to the Salisons in Torquay. It's all <laughs> Nonsense, right. Well, I can't. Bring oh, them up and put it off for a few days. <laughs> What's 
Peter knows that you're here, he won't think of letting you go under a foot. Oh, now, <laughs> not another word. I'll go and find him. Oh, but no, Anne, I must no. go. I'm... I'm so sorry. I didn't know anybody oh, no, no, was no, in here. Come in, Mrs. Langston. This is an old friend of mine, Mr. Oh, Anne. How do you do? I haven't seen him in years, and I'm just getting my breath back. Oh, how dreadful of me. This telegram came for you 20 minutes ago. Really? I was on my way to find you, and I ran slap into Mr. Amberwell. I'm so sorry. Quite all right. I can't think who could be sending me a telegram. Well, I hope it's nothing worse than the decease of a particularly unpleasant relative. <laughs> oh, a, a wealthy unpleasant relative, huh? <laughs> well, unfortunately, the Lancaster clan boasts only one rich relative, and that's me. Oh. Well, you are partially right, though. It does concern a relative, though hardly a deceased one. Oh? My niece. Can't say I'm delighted at the prospect. Oh, I say. <laughs> oh, I should explain, Mr. Amberwell. You see, I'm Peggy's legal guardian, and I was rather looking forward to her trip to Paris as a sort of vacation from the duties uh. of chaperonage. <laughs> I suppose you do have a spare room, don't you? Oh, any number of them, I'm sorry to say. Oh, dear. Why is she coming back so soon? Well, measles is broken out in the family she's with now, and so they're sending her to me. Oh, I hope she's not going to bring her measles here. Is she? <laughs> <laughs> no, Peggy's had measles, though I can't oh. guarantee she won't get something else, provided she can be sure of it's creating a stir. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go and have Mary get a room ready for her. Thank and I'll tell Peter about you. Oh, my goodness. Red Roof is experiencing a great increase in custom all oh, of a sudden. Nice. I must start coping. <laughs> Excuse me, George. Mrs. Uh, Lancaster? Yes, Don't be long, dear. Tell me, Mr. Amberwell, are you a very old friend of the Hammond? Oh, not half, yes. Absolutely bowled me over meeting Mrs. Hammond again. You know, the three of us were together, oh, four or five years ago. The show at the Aldridge, six months. Oh, then mm. you're an actor, too. Oh, no, no, stage manager. Oh, I see. Oh, then you knew Mr. Hammond before the... Oh, yeah, the accident. Oh, uh, yes. Dreadful, dreadful affair, yes. Brilliant career, just wiped out in a second. How did it happen? Well, the most ridiculous thing imaginable. Crossing the road to get a newspaper to find his notices, the great success the night before. Unbelievable. One of his greatest performances. Well, I was in the provinces at the time, because when I heard about George. it... George! <laughs> they tell me you're suffering from stripped gears or some similar automotive ailment. Peter. <laughs> Oh, George, it is good to see you, old boy. Anne tells me you're planning to go on to Torquay tomorrow. Well, I won't hear of it. I shan't be satisfied with anything less than a fortnight's stay. Peter, I had no idea that... Oh, really, old boy? Oh, well, don't let it upset you, George. Why, this was the clincher at the trial. <laughs> the attorney for the bus company tried to save them a few shillings, but all the jury had to do was take one look at me in my chair of pain, and they shouted as a man, we fine for the plaintiff. <laughs> Oh, I say, you were away during the trial, weren't you? Oh, that's too bad. It was my greatest performance by far. <laughs> yes, I, I was in the provinces at the time. Oh, you know, the high point of the trial was when I took the stand and they tried to back me into the corner. I say, Hammond, uh, that bus that allegedly struck you while you were crossing the street, uh, which size bus would you say it was, sir? Oh, I'd say it was one of the larger ones, sir. Oh, I believe you have... We have you there, Mr. Hammond. All of the buses in London are the same size, are they not? Uh, no, sir. The ones that come at you are the larger. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, George, I was stellar, absolutely stellar. <laughs> you were also stellar in uh, West Winds Fading. I read the notices. Yes, they were good, they weren't were. they? All except Dalrymple and the Express. <laughs> he said I lacked finish. Hmm, lacked finish, eh? Well, he certainly lived to eat those words. <laughs> Plenty of finish around here. Nothing but finish, in fact. Finish. <laughs> My dear Peter, I... Oh, George, I am sorry. Please forgive me. Mrs. Lancaster, my friend Mr. Amberwell is embarrassed. <laughs> Would you be so good as to tell him the rules of the house that all that nonsense about pitying the poor innkeeper is out of date to say nothing about out of bounds? <laughs> Mr. Hammond ought to be on display, really, he ought. You know, I've often suggested to him that he form himself into some kind of exhibit to be shown at hospitals and homes for the cripples. Well, well, I should go on brooding about it, I always <laughs> say. In fact, I always was a lazy lad. I'd rather sit down than stand up any oh, day. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry for people who have to be cooped up. Oh. oh, Mrs. West, we were having some kind of a reunion. Old friends that pass in the night like ships, you know. <laughs> May I introduce you to the latest uh, addition to the Red Roof household? Mr. Amberwell, mm -hmm. Mrs. West, and do do? Julian West. How do you do? Are you an actor, Mr. Amberwell? Uh, no, stage manager. Mm -hmm. Julian's a budding young author, George. Oh, really? Yes, I've read some of his things today. Oh, now, Peter, I don't oh, think really, you Oh, really, really, Julian, they're quite good, really quite good. They lack a bit of finish, I should say, but that's easy enough to fix up. <laughs> finish is very important, eh, George? <laughs> 
Oh, you've been very kind to Julian, but I don't know whether to thank you or not, Mr. Hammond. You see, we've never had an author in the West family before. We've always been in trade. But Mrs. Westy shows a great deal of promise. Oh. In fact, I, I doubt if there's an inn in all of England that has more talent crammed into it. <laughs> there's Anne and Julian and George and myself to a certain extent, to say nothing of your prowess with the knitting needles. <laughs> What is your talent, Mrs. Lancaster? Oh, Mr. Hammond, I have no talents. I, I simply buy the tickets to see the plays and patronize the bookseller to read the books. <laughs> but there would be no art without an audience, would there, Mr. Hammond? Certainly not. That's a very important talent, Mrs. Lancaster. Patronage. Now, what would the artist do without a patron? Now, do you understand what I'm driving at? Really, Mr. Hammond, you're speaking in riddles today. Well, here we all are. Oh, Anne, darling, hello. I thought we'd have tea out on the terrace. It's such a lovely day. Well, everything's taken care of. Your room's all ready for you, George. And Mrs. Lancaster, there's a room waiting for Peggy whenever she arrives. Oh, thank you. Peggy, your niece? Yes, my niece. Is she coming here? Oh, that'll be wonderful. From all you've told me about her, I'm looking forward to meeting her. Yes. Are you, Julian? You should find Peggy very charming. She can be charming when she likes. Just like you, Julian. Will you excuse me, please? Well, what was that? Did you offend Mrs. Lancaster, Julian? Well, how should I know? I'd better go and apologize at any rate. <laughs> well, my dears, would you call me for tea? I think I'll go up to my room for a while. Welcome to Red Roof. Oh. I hope you'll stay for a while. Thank no, you. Don't worry, he will. Yes, well. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> do, uh... Do I sense a situation? Oh, it's horrible. That spoiled boy and that desperate widow trying to buy back 20 years of life. <gasps> no! God. And of course, he doesn't know about it. Doesn't he, though? That innocent child is planning to make a million pounds off of Hilda's declining years. <laughs> he knows a good thing when he sees it. She's uh, planning to publish his short stories, George. I think you encourage it. Oh, now, really? But <laughs> well, you won't deny that you're constantly buttering the boy up about his stories, when actually they're nothing but miserable examples of public school pros. Oh, the lengths one has to go to find amusement down here. But I am anticipating an increase of merriment hourly. Oh, what now? Peggy Lancaster. I understand she's a very attractive young thing and just about Julian's age. Oh, -ho. Uh -huh. no <laughs> wonder she resents the proposed visitation. Oh, oh nonsense. <laughs> no, it isn't nonsense, Anne. No, Peggy Lancaster is going to bring Julian a breath of all that he's been missing in life. <laughs> and it'll be very amusing to watch the reaction on Julian and on Mrs. Lancaster. <laughs> Just as George has suddenly brought you a breath of all you've been missing. I don't know what you mean. May I reiterate Mrs. West's greeting? Welcome to Red Roof, George. about you. You were gone so long. There's a storm coming up. Yes. Great billowing clouds and the sun shining gray through them. And the wind. Peter, we ought to go home. It's only an hour till dinner. It's a pity nature didn't provide music with her storms. Very remiss of her, don't you think? Uh, well, unfortunately, nature didn't have the benefit of a movie soundtrack when she invented thunderstorms. Oh, that's very witty of you, and Very sharp. <laughs> Sounds almost like the old Anne. Really? Well, I wasn't aware that I'd become a new Anne. Oh, yes, these things happen almost imperceptibly. You sounded like Miss Anne Hammond, character ingenue just then. Oh. Must be George's influence. A taste of the old times. Oh, Peter, I thought that wild notion had died a morning. You haven't mentioned it since that first night. It occurs to me now and again. Were you brooding about it? My dear Anne, I stopped brooding when I stopped walking. Speaking of walking, did you and George have a good walk today? Well, George might have. I didn't. Didn't enjoy it? I didn't go. Oh, now, look. Must be a good walker, George. Strong pair of legs. Oh, Peter, once and for all. Well, how is our triangle coming along with Hilda and Julian and Peggy? Hmm? I have no idea. My duty is here a landlady, not house mother. I'm not required to interfere. 
And, and neither are you, Peter. Are you inferring that I'm interfering? Wildly and irresponsible. Well, my dear Anne. My dear Peter, it's none of your business. <laughs> I assure you, I couldn't care less. <laughs> She is an attractive young thing, though, Peggy Lancaster. I wonder if Julian's really spitting. Oh, Peter. Oh, of course, Hilda would never allow it. She just, she gets wild every time she even sees them together. I wonder what she'll do about it. There are two ways of playing that scene, you oh, know. Oh, Peter, I'm not interested. Either she can fly into a rage and send Peggy away, which will solve nothing and only convince the children that they're madly in love, or she can bide her time patiently and then, just when they come to her, for her blessing, she can say quite quietly, Peggy, my dear, guess what your young man has been up to before he met you? Oh, Julian's been up to nothing, except a little mild embezzlement. Yeah, and don't you just know that Hilda kept all of the cancelled checks? She's too good a businesswoman not to keep books. <laughs> Peggy's a clean-minded, bright-eyed young thing. The picture of her young man living off the largesse of an older woman would present a particularly distasteful picture to her. Uh, Peter, I didn't come here to talk about that. I want to talk about George. Yes, I thought you would. Not the way you think. So it's still there, is it? Some tug at the heart, some not quite dead emotion. The attraction's still there. There's no attraction. There never was. Oh, very well. If you say so, I thought you wanted to talk about it. You're making George very uncomfortable. Yes, I dare say. It's an uncomfortable situation. Inexcusable in an innkeeper, but so human, eh? Are you human? Sometimes I wonder. Down to the waist, I'm quite human. Oh, don't be too hard on me, Anne. He has such a good pair of legs. Call me inhuman if you like, but I'm human enough to envy them. Oh, Peter. I'm supposed to be the model cripple. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Come and see the man with no legs. He laughs, he jokes, he pretends it doesn't matter. Oh, Anne. That bus had every chance in the world. Why didn't it do a complete job? Oh, Peter, Peter, Peter. Don't be too upset. Don't take me too seriously. Consider how frustrated I am. I, I can't take revenge on a bus. Do you know I love you? I thought so. I do. Say you love me and then we can all go home happily. Say I love you. I love you. There, you see. End of quarrel. Quick curtain. Did you enjoy the film? Enjoy it? Oh, well? absolutely awful. No, dreadful, dreadful. Most comforting, really. No, I couldn't have borne them otherwise. <laughs> You're back rather late. I didn't think it could have lasted that long. No, oh. we persuaded George to drive us on into Torquay for a little music and dancing. How accommodating of George. Oh, not at all. No, no, no. It was a bit messy when the rain started. Otherwise, it was most pleasant. <laughs> Let's hope you all don't come down with a cold by morning. Peggy, I suggest you get out of those wet clothes immediately and go to bed. Oh, I'm all right. My concern is to see that you stay all right. Well, Peggy and I are planning a little game of table tennis before we turn in. But I'm sure you'll excuse Peggy. I'm not sure I want to be excused. Peggy, I'd rather not discuss this just now. I must say I'm a little surprised at your attitude. Under the circumstances, I'll excuse it. Under what circumstances? Well, I've just had a wire from your Aunt Sarah. Oh, is she well? Quite well, and looking forward to your visit. My visit? Peggy, you didn't tell me that you... She didn't know. I wrote to Aunt Sarah a few days ago, and she just replied saying she'd be delighted to have you come and stay with her. Now, I suggest that a good time to go would be tomorrow. I think it will be a horrid time. They live on a blasted heath in Scotland. <laughs> I'm not going. Peggy, you're expected. Oh, that's too bad. Telegrams go in both directions. But the matter's settled. The matter isn't settled. Or perhaps it is. I'm not going to Aunt Sarah's tomorrow or at any other time. Peggy, I absolutely refuse to discuss this any longer. I've had enough of your adolescent rebellion for one evening. The matter is settled. You will go to bed now and you will go to your Aunt Sarah tomorrow. Now, is that clear? But is it clear, Peggy? Good night, all. It's been charming. I'll see you up. The corridor is well lighted and the staircase is quite safe. I'm sure Peggy can see herself up. 
I'm sorry, Mr. Amberwell, please. Oh, no, no, not at all. No, it's quite all right, quite all right. Uh, I, um, uh, well, I think I'll go to bed now. You, you may be right about that code and coming on. Good yes. night. Good night. Good night, Julian. Good night, George. That was rather crude. I don't think you're in a position to use that word. Peggy hasn't harmed you. Peggy is not my concern at the moment. Cinema, music, dancing. Very lavish, very extravagant. Must have been expensive, Julian. Well, I'm entitled to a little fun. And there's no reason to treat Peggy so brutally. You're hardly in a position to tell me about that. You're too young. You mustn't blame me for being young, Hilda. And I'm afraid sending her away isn't going to solve anything. What do you mean by that? I mean that I'm liable to follow her if you do. Julian! I'm in love with Peggy. I have reason to believe that she's in love with me. I'm sorry if it hurts you. Well, I must say you're being very thoughtful. I want to marry her. Do you expect me to permit it? Oh, I don't expect you to try to prevent it. You don't? Oh, why should you? Oh, just because you lent me a little money. Lent I... you? You'll be repaid. I don't care about the money. Oh, you sound as though you care very much. Don't you know why I've given you things? I know this, that you're probably not too anxious to have everyone know your reasons. Your real reasons. I'm only trying to tell you that you don't own me completely. I'm afraid you've been thinking you did. Oh, you're despicable! Despicable! Cleared up beautifully, didn't it? Oh, yes, sir. I laid breakfast out here. I thought it would be preferred. As always, your judgment in these matters is impeccable. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Mrs. Hammond? Is she in the kitchen? No, sir. She's gone swimming. Swimming? Oh, surely not. Before breakfast? Yes, sir. I saw her go down toward the water about half an hour ago. That Mr. Amberwell was with her. I expect they're both swimming. Thank you, Mary. Yes, sir. I'll have my breakfast now. Yes, sir. Would you like kippers or egg? I'll leave that entirely up to you. Yes, sir. I'll bring you a bit of food. Morning, Peter. What a glorious morning. One shouldn't mind the rain, should one, considering what it does to the world after it gets finished? Well, you must have gotten yourself so thoroughly soaked last night. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because your radiance absolutely dims out nature. Why, right, Peter? Nobody else down yet? No, it appears not. Would you like to have breakfast with me this morning, darling? I'd love to. Oh, there you are. Thank Forgive you. my not getting up. Don't give it a second thought. Bravo, Peggy. What now? You don't shock easily, do you? That's <laughs> most admirable and most unusual. You wanted to shock me. That's why I didn't shock. I believe you really like to shock people. I believe you found me out. You heard about the row with my aunt last night? Yes. May I tell you something, Peggy? You can be the ringmaster in your life, if you choose. Or you can be just one of the acts, in the spotlight for a few minutes and then back to the cage for the rest of your days. You've got to make up your mind now. Oh, good morning, Mr. Hammond. Good morning. Good morning, Peggy. Aunt Hilda. Shouldn't you be packing? I don't think so, Aunt Hilda. You see, I'm not going anywhere. Not going? Peggy, I told you last night. Mr. Hammond, you haven't been trying to influence her, have you? Why, Mrs. Lancaster, what a thing. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, no. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wonderful morning. Everybody down. Ah. Everybody except the West. Well, did you have a good swim? Oh, it was mm. wonderful. Do you realize we've been here since May, and this is the first time I thought about going swimming before breakfast? Since George's influence, I'd <laughs> expect he's brought about a lot of changes since he arrived. No, as a matter of fact, it was Anne's idea. I was on my way down to breakfast, and I ran into her. Now, these chance meetings could be most revealing. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I had the sniffles coming on, and she said salt water was the best thing in the world for oh, My wife has very definite 
views on medical science, and I suppose you felt the sniffles coming on too, eh, Anne? No. George wouldn't go unless I went too. And so you went, all in the spirit of good, clean health and well-being. <laughs> well, I hope you don't mind. Oh, on the contrary, I'm delighted. I'm overjoyed whenever I see that radiant, ecstatic look on Anne's face. Almost as though she'd seen the Holy Grail. You're in a very agreeable mood this morning. Oh, I bloom in all my colors after the storm, just like the trees and the grass. I think I'll go and change. Well, there's no need to make an uncomfortable exit, George. As far as I'm concerned, the incident is closed. I wasn't aware there was an incident to close. Well, that, of course, is problematical. I see nothing problematical about it. My dear Anne, our guests are becoming embarrassed. Now, look here, old man. Oh, That's really, what? George, please, not old man. It makes me feel as though Granville Barker were peering over my shoulder. Good morning, everybody. Isn't it going to be a perfect day? Well, certainly starting out that way, Mrs. West. Good morning, Julian. Good morning, Peter. Mrs. Hammond, George. Hello, Peggy. Hello, Julian. Good morning, Julian. Hello, Hilda. Good morning. Now, look here, Hammond. Oh, that's I... much better, George. Now, please sit down, all of you, and have your breakfast. I understand there's a choice between kippers and eggs. Feel free to order both if you're hungry enough. If you don't mind, I won't stay. Peter! You're not amusing me. I'm so sorry. George amuse you more? What are you doing? What's this game you're playing? You look very lovely in your bathing suit, Anne. How does George look in shorts? Mm, well set up, muscular, and how are his legs? Have you gone completely insane? That has seemed to me like common enough questions. Extremely common. I know your little games, Peter. I know how you like to amuse yourself. But this is the first time you've seen fit to make me the butt of your twisted sense of humor. I was just trying to be generous. I didn't want you to go overboard pitying the poor cripple. If you want George... I don't want George! Does he want you? The subject's never been mentioned. It's very clean-minded of both of you. It has nothing to do with clean-mindedness. There's never been any cause, any reason. Oh, Peter, this is ridiculous. Out of nothing at all, out of a, an innocent word, a, a gesture, you, you built up something that's nothing but a lie from beginning to end. And I know why you're doing it. You don't even believe it yourself. It just amuses you to exert power, to, to toy with people's lives, ruin them if necessary, just so long as it provides you with a diverting half hour or so. Please go on. This is most entertaining. It may be entertaining to you, but to me it's a bore. A bore? Yes, a bore. Anyone who isn't a real person's a bore. And you're not a real person at all. You haven't had a sincere thought in your life, Peter, and it's made you dull. Yes, dull, dull, dull beyond dreams. You really mean that, don't you? Yes, I do. So I'm dull, am I? Well, I hope this doesn't oh, bore you, oh. Anne, because if it does, you're going to be bored for quite oh. some time to come. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. But I'm not sorry. You will be, George. Now, tell me, tell me if I've got this right. It's at the 409, 613, 925. Right there. Oh, and where do the, where do the buses leave from? Thank you. Listening, Peter? Like a hawk, if that's the expression. Sometimes I'm not quite sure which side you're on. Oh, I've made flattering remarks about your writing. Oh, very friendly remarks. Very flattering. Now, Peggy's been more friendly. Oh, she doesn't like them. Oh, she says that I can do better. They're unworthy of me. Oh, but then she's in love with you. Well, does that mean she's not being honest with me? Oh, I dare say as honest as you are being with her. I'm planning to be honest. You mean about Hilda and you? Oh, that was only... Only um... money, yes, I know. And your motives in accepting it were as pure as can be. But what about her motives in giving it? And what about the chances of her telling Peggy? I think you had better tell Peggy yourself, Julian, first. Yes, I know. But, but afterwards, you heard me just now. You know what we're planning to do. Hilda insists that Peggy leave. But well, if she does, I'm going with her. Bravo, Julian. 
And what about money? Peggy has some. Oh, no, that would never do. Don't start out married life as a gigolo. Well, I certainly have none of my own. Oh, very well. <laughs> oh, no, Peter, you, Here no, you, you can't do that. It's something to start with. It'll get you as far as London anyway. <laughs> oh, that's terribly good of you. Why are you doing this? I hate grubby little gestures. You're going to break somebody's heart, Julian. For heaven's sakes, do it in style. What exactly does Julian mean to you? He means everything to me. And do you mean everything to him? Yes. Peggy, I know Julian better than you. You've known him longer. Better. And let me tell you, to him, you're just a holiday amusement, nothing else. He's never going to really care about anyone. You're entitled to your own views. Hello, you two. Nearly ready? Almost. How does that concern you, Julian? Why, Hilda, you don't expect Peggy to lug these heavy suitcases down to the bus stop herself, do you? Well, I was going to get Mr. Amberwell to take her down in his car. I'm afraid that's out. Uh, George is going up to London. He's leaving very soon. George is leaving? Why? Oh, he says they're starting rehearsals a fortnight earlier than planned. However, from the look on his face at lunch today, I would say that something's going on. He was looking glum, now you mention it. So was Mrs. Hammond, as a matter of fact. Yes, today's been rather a grim one so far. Well, what have you two been up to? We've been spending a not too profitable few minutes discussing you, Julian. How alarming. From what aspect? Are there so many? Oh, it might be uh, biological, spiritual, uh, intellectual. Or uh, financial. What does she know about your hidden past, Julian? More than I do, apparently. Peggy, don't dawdle. You don't want to miss your butts. I'll be downstairs. We are, Julian. You're not backing out, are you? No, of course not. But it does seem a shame that other people have to be hurt. Julian? What, darling? What does Hilda know about you? She knows... Yes? What I really am. And what are you really? I'm mean, selfish, revoltingly weak. Who's that? What do you mean, who's that? For a minute, I thought it was something serious. Suppose it were. What? Something serious. Such as? Such as? Oh, nothing, come on. Let's hurry, we've got to catch that bus. Are you sure? Now, look, here's the plan. Very simple, very casual. I'm just being the gentleman, seeing you down to the bus stop with your luggage. <laughs> Are you sure nobody knows? Only Peter, and he's on our side. Darling. Whatever happens, whatever you may come to think of me, I'll always love you, Peggy. Well, I don't see how I can stay after... Why didn't you tell me before? Tell you what? That he was like that. Oh, he isn't always. Always? When everyone adores him, no one can be nicer. But they mustn't stop, not for a moment. Charming for you. Oh, it isn't really so bad. You see, I'm usually able to adore him quite adequately for his purposes. What about for your purposes? Oh, don't misunderstand me, George. I love Peter. Does he love you? I'm his most valuable possession. He couldn't get along without me. Mm. Couldn't he? He's just a child, really. Yes, he has some very unattractive childish tricks, too. And... Yes, George? Something I must tell you. My real reason for leaving. Well, I should think it was obvious. Peter's decided we're in love. We're not. But it's quite impossible to convince him. The situation's become impossible. It's more impossible than you think, you see. Something put the idea into Peter's head. Oh, just his imagination, nothing else. No, it's not as simple as all that. Something did put the idea into his head. 
I'm afraid it was I. What do you mean? Because, you see, it's true. I do love you. Oh, George. I... I loved you... Oh. From the day that you married Peter six years ago. Oh, my dear, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Oh, of course. Peter must have seen it even then. Now he's trying to get it back at you. Perhaps he has a right to. Because, you see, I... I've never really given up hope. And I... Is... Is there any chance that... I'm sorry, George. None whatever. You see, Peter needs me. I see. taking on the aspect of Paddington Station. <laughs> I hope you're going to stay on for a bit, Mrs. West and Mrs. Lancaster. I see no reason to cut short my visit, nor I. Although I'm sorry your niece is leaving so soon. She and Julian seem to get on so well. So I noticed. I was hoping they might become friends. Julian has so few friends, especially girls his own age. I don't know why. Well, perhaps you underestimate him, Mrs. West. Oh, do you think so? Well, what I mean is perhaps he gets more out of his friendships with, um, older people. Yes, I dare say you may be right. I'd never thought of that. H his writings now, maybe they indicate something. You always said that they, you thought yes, they were... Yes, one good. of the duties of an innkeeper is to try to please his guests, is it not? You mean that I'm very don't... much afraid, Mrs. West, that Julian's writings, as you call them, are grammatically accurate and very little else. Why are you saying this now? But you've always said I'm that well aware of what to... I've always said. I'm also well aware that I didn't ask to read the story. Well, George, you must be on your way, eh? Yes, I am. Be sure to remember me to a couple of hundred people up in London. You're not worth remembering to. You're well remembered as it is. Well, you really think so? Isn't that nice? <laughs> I suppose you and Anne have been out taking a last look at the ocean, eh? Yes, Peter. You know, my wife has a very personal interest in the ocean. She always keeps a constant eye on it to be sure that the tides don't become confused and start moving in the wrong way. Peter, there's one thing... Y yes, George. I want to make clear. Well, I think your leaving makes several things clear, George. Now, look here. I'm looking, George. Peggy! Ah, trains leaving on platform 17, Great Western Express, <laughs> Torquay, Exeter, Exmouth, Reading and London Board. <laughs> Gone mad, Peter? No, I'm just doing my part. So many sudden departures taking place. Well, not so many. Only Peggy and George. Oh, of course. What am I thinking of? Oh, I see. Now, why should Peggy take that dull bus ride into Torquay and then take the train up to London? When George is driving straight up from here, what do you say, George? You have plenty of room for Peggy, haven't you? Why, yes, of course. I, it didn't occur to me. I... Peter! What's the matter, Julian? Why are you making those ridiculous faces? Well, surely you, you would like the company, wouldn't you, George? Peter, it's very kind of I'm you. I'm sure Mr. Was... Amberwell doesn't mind. Peggy would be delighted. But it's impossible. Impossible? Why impossible? It, it's only a two-seater. Well, so it is. And there are only two of them going up. <laughs> Peggy and George. One, two, three. Peter! Julian, dear, why are you being so tense about it? Surely it's a matter just between Mr. Amberwell and Peggy. Well, that's what I was about to say. Well, I am right, aren't I? There are only two people going up to London today. Well, how many people are going up to London today? Well, am I mistaken or am I not? Are there more than two people going up to London today? <laughs> Perhaps I should have hired a bus. I don't know what it's all about. But I'll be very glad to take Miss Lancaster if she's agreeable. Ah, there we are. So it's all settled. It what are you trying to do? My dear Peggy, is that any way to talk to me after I've just saved you a train fare? If you persist in using that tone with me, I shall feel obliged to ask Julian to return the ten pounds I lent him. Peter! Yes, Julian? I... Uh, never uh, mind. It'll come to you later. You lent Julian ten pounds? Why, whatever for... Well, it was nothing, Mother. Just a few bills, that's all. Well, then why didn't you ask me? You know I don't like you to borrow money from other people. Don't you? I rather thought you did. But then I suppose you would be reluctant to lend him money if you knew what he intended to do with it. What did you intend to do with it? Why didn't you know? He's going to be married. Stop it! Is this some sort of joke? Well, that depends upon one's sense of humor. Well, then I think you'd better explain. Shall I, Peggy? 
shall I do? Well, I take it that your silence means assent. Well, very well. Peggy and Julian are running away to get married. Isn't it fun? It isn't true, Julian. No, of course it isn't. There isn't a word of truth in it. Well, then why were you so tense about it? And why were you putting your clothes in Peggy's bag so they wouldn't be found? Peter. And why were you looking up bus schedules just now? Julian, were you really going to do this? Yes. yes. I can't believe you'd do anything so loathsome. I love Peggy. Miss I Tilda! Are you ready to go with me now? Yes. Let's go then. Hey, where you are. But haven't you anything to say, Mrs. Lancaster? Haven't you? Very well, then I'll say it for you. What your aunt is trying to say, Peggy, and can't, is why you should be so determined to elope with her, what shall we call him, Mrs. Lancaster, her paid companion. Julian, what does he mean? What I mean, Mrs. West, is that Mrs. Lancaster has been giving your son large sums of money all summer, and she's naturally reluctant to see her niece running away with her investment. No, you couldn't have taken money from Mrs. Lancaster. Couldn't he? Look at his face, Mrs. West. You too, Peggy. If you say any more, I think I'll kill you. Julian, it's not true. It is true, Peggy. I tried to warn you. Don't talk to me. Peggy. It all happened before I met you. I love you. You must believe me. Believe you? There's no sense in believing anything anymore. Peggy! You better follow where those cliffs are dangerous and there's a fog rolling in. I know what you're thinking. You can sneer all you want, all of you. Just wait. Wait until you see the only thing you've ever wanted leaving you. You'll try to buy it back. Or steal it. Oh, Peggy, it's just the way I am. Peggy, Peggy! Julian! No, Julian. It could be all right. You'll see. It could be all right. Why did you do all this? We've never done you any harm. Perhaps I'm trying to buy something that money's not any good for either, Mrs. West. Come upstairs, Julian. Satisfied now, Peter? You haven't any guts, Julian. No, I haven't. If I had, I'd have thrashed you right here and now. Please feel perfectly free. Hitting cripples has become the thing to do around here lately. Ah. Now, George, I'm sorry. You have to drive up to London all alone. <laughs> no, he won't, Peter. If you're ready to leave, I'll meet you outside in five minutes. I'll be there. So, I was right. George and you, I was right. I ought to feel sorry for you, Peter. I really ought. You strike out in every direction, but the only person you hit is yourself. Whom have you hurt? Julian and his mother? They'll recover. Hilda and Peggy? They'll recover, too. George will get over this incident, and so will I. But you won't, Peter. You're the only one who's been destroyed. No one else. I'm going, Peter. I don't know where or what to do, but I'm leaving. And you won't even have the satisfaction of knowing that it's with George, because it isn't. You'll be back. Oh, no, I won't, Peter. Not this time. Yes, you'll be back. I'm a cripple and you've got a conscience. You won't leave me. Do you think that's the only reason I've stayed with you all these years? Of course. Why else? If it weren't for that, you'd have gone off with George a long time ago. You're mad, Peter. Am I? I'll never give you a divorce, Annie. Goodbye, Peter. Anne? Anne, wait! It's annoying, isn't it, Peter? The ringmaster cracks his whip. But the animals have all left the cages. Anne? Anne, you can't leave me. It would be wicked to leave me. Goodbye, Peter. Anne? Anne! Oh, oh Anne! Anne, somebody! Help me, help me! I, I can't move!
ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Vincent Price and Miss Anna Lee. And I'm sure that you'll want to join with me in thanking them for two perfectly splendid performances. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you so much, Vincent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank a you. wonderful job. What plans have you got for the future? What are you going to do? Some more TV? Well, I hope lots more television, because I love it. You really like mm, it? I really well, like it. Well, it shows, <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Vincent? Oh, so do I, Bob. I'm crazy about TV. I'm going to do some summer stock, I think, pretty soon. Good for you. What are you going to do in summer stock? Oh, I don't know. A couple of plays. A couple hope. of plays. <laughs> yes. And you're going to stay on here and do some TV in the meantime? Yes, that's right. Good for you. Well, we hope to have you both back before very long. Thank you. It was a great pleasure being with you. Good. It was lovely. Ladies and gentlemen, remember one week from night from tonight you'll see Robert Sterling in Candles for Therese, a strange story of love against a background of fear and vengeance. Remember, one neat week from tonight, Candles for Therese, starring Robert Sterling, and also remember the name to look for in wax is Johnson. Thank you very much for being with us and good night. <laughs>